Let's go and talk to Benny Pizer. He's the director of the Global Warming Policy Foundation because I want to try and get head or tail of COP28. It is next week. It is in the United Arab Emirates, which is a very appropriate place for it because they have a very clear narrative in the UAE, which is that the energy transition is not tomorrow. It's not even next week. We're going to need oil and gas for the next 30 to 40 years. And they are saying, what better country in the world like the UAE, or indeed Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Iran, for hosting, can't really have it in Iran at the moment, uh, for hosting such an event. And the UAE has won many plaudits for its uh, peaceful and tolerant approach to trying to soothe, to calm down enemy tensions between people. It's friends with Iran again, it's friends with Qatar, it's friends with Israel. So it is developing a normalization around the world. So it is a sort of beacon for peace. So let's try and find out more about why and where with Dr. Benny Pizer. Benny, welcome to Talk TV. Thanks for having me. Now, Benny, uh, the Labour opposition in this country is saying quite the opposite of what the UAE and its oil energy providers are, 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 are doing, which is that they would stop licenses for new North Seal exploration next year or if when they got elected. But surely that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. We still need oil and gas before we transition in something like the 2070s or 2080s. Yeah, of course. And I very much doubt that uh, Labour, once they are in government, will stick to this pledge as energy prices continue to rise and Britain becomes increasingly dependent on imports from countries around the world. Uh, there will be growing pressure, particularly from the unions, to use our own resources. Um, but Britain is not alone. Um, almost every country that is drilling for oil and gas is increasing its output. Um, it's becoming quite um, evident that the demand for oil and gas and incidentally for coal as well is growing, particularly in Asia, in the growing economies of Asia. And so there is no chance whatsoever that that is going to be curtailed in the foreseeable future. So, Benny, they keep on talking about the next 40 years before the energy transition is finally completed. Is that an estimate or indeed will we have oil and gas into the 22nd century? Are we really running out of these fossil fuels? Well, these are two different questions, obviously. First of all, we're not running out of fossil fuels because the shale revolution in the U.S., has opened a whole new resource, which is massive. The new Argentinian president has promised to go big time for shale oil and gas. Argentina is one of the biggest shale countries in the world. Uh, other countries are following. Um, in countries in Europe are rolling back its green policies, left, right, and center. There is not a single country, not even Britain, um, that is sticking to its traditional or conventional net zero policies. And today you could read that even Labour is watering down its net zero pledges and, and spending promises. It's obvious that uh, the economy uh, comes first and energy security comes first before all these green ideas. No one knows how long um, we will need to rely on fossil fuels, but it will be a few decades. It won't happen, as you said, overnight or even in, in, in a few years. This will be a very long process. Which begs the question, why is there such a political will to transition to more blue energy? Why is there this climate change pressure when oil and gas seems to go on forever and ever and ever? This pressure is only in Europe. Right. Uh, nowhere else. The rest of the world is laughing their heads off to see how Europe is struggling with its green transition, uh, the energy cost crisis. Most of the world don't take any um, taking this any seriously, this, this green transition. In fact, um, countries like Germany, who've moved away and shut down nuclear, are going back to coal. Uh, nice. for, you know, I mean, 
and 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 we've seen all over the world and not least now in Holland the backlash against these very costly policies so um, the COP28, this is the 28th UN climate conference, will essentially end like all previous climate conferences. They will agree in the last minute, agree to meet again next year. So not much uh, will happen. Um, Twas ever thus. Um, I guess my next question is about the future of energy in this country because there is the sudden urge, isn't there, to try and become more energy efficient. We know all about Scotland and North Sea oil, but there is oil in England. There is oil in Dorset. There is oil near Bournemouth. And if you go near Bournemouth to the coast, you see dollies like you see in Texas. I mean, they don't deliver a huge amount of oil, but nevertheless, there is oil in Dorset. And I remember this huge snap which came up on my um, uh, news feed that they'd found. This is the most incredible snap I'd ever seen, a headline. And it was sort of denied very quickly, was that they'd found, and I couldn't believe it. I, I took a photo of this snap because it's there forever. They found what this is unbelievable 100 billion barrels of oil under Gatwick Airport. And I was sort of, my mind was blown at that sort of idea, and then it was denied. Uh, and so the question is, Benny, I mean, it's a very urban place. There's an airport there. Obviously, there are major cities. There's South London and everything. They're not going to dig up London. And anyway, what kind of oil is under West Sussex these days? Who knows? Who the, knows? The more Im important issue is not just how much oil there is. There is hardly much. Let's, let's face it, it's not huge. So it's but not 100 billion we, barrels. But what we do have is one of the biggest shale basins in the world in the north of England. Are we With talking Blackpool area? Indeed. Uh, in Lancashire. Yeah. And in Yorkshire. Uh, huge reserves of shale gas. And I would not rule out that under a Labour government and increasing pressure by the unions and the, the rise in energy costs and the rise in costs of importing gas rather than using our own, I would not rule out that even under Labour government we might see a return to fracking and getting the shale gas out of the ground using our own natural gas. Benny, which would solve the levelling up policy of Absolutely. this particular government, because of course Absolutely. it would bring literally billions of pounds to the north of England, not just Lancashire, but Yorkshire, but also and jobs, jobs, and said, people, unions, economy, skyscrapers, a new Absolutely. second city. You know, the possibilities are endless, aren't they? Yeah, well, you look at the US, what shale gas has done to the US economy is absolutely staggering. It also brings in new industries because if you can um, bring down the cost of gas through your own resources, it will make Britain attractive again for inward investment. With high energy costs, Britain is not a very attractive place. And so any company that is building factories currently, energy intensive factories, is relying on government's subsidies. They are all begging uh, for support and they're not building anything unless the government coughs off hundreds of millions of pounds in subsidies. So, as I said, we are sitting on a gold mine in the north of England uh, of, of shale gas and I would not be surprised if uh, the unions will succeed in convincing Labour to actually get it out of the ground. So the future is bright, the future is shale, Benny. Absolutely. And remember, there are estimates that this is not just in, in, in Britain, there are other parts of Europe where, where fracking is banned as well. And Europe is desperate for natural gas. They're even going to Africa. To, they tell the Africans, don't use gas and oil, but sell us your oil and gas. <laughs> <laughs> Which begs the question, Benny, what will happen to the future of the narrative of climate change if the political will and the union will is there to examine these huge shale reserves, not just in Britain, but in the rest of the Western world? It'll change the that's, climate change narrative. It'll, it'll calm it down a bit, won't it? Yeah, well, that's a very important issue. <laughs> I think once governments are desperate for 
and, and realize that they will have to use fossil fuels for longer, they will be desperate to calm down the hysteria and say, look, um, okay, so emissions will continue to go up a bit longer, but we have more time to adapt and to sort out climate change. I'm pretty sure that uh, without that, it will be difficult for any government to U-turn, uh, but we do have more time. I mean, global warming is happening, but it's happening much, much slower than all the predictions we've heard in the last 20, 30 years. So that's the good news. We do have more time and, and that allows governments to actually come to their senses and, and, and implement more rational energy policies that don't hurt the economy, don't hurt families. What will Greta Thunberg do by the time she hits 30? That's the next question. Benny, thank you very much. Dr. Benny Pizer is the director of Global Warming Policy Foundation with a sort of hint of positivity there. It's not all doom and gloom. There is a hope for our future energy requirements. There is a requirement to change the political narrative to move us away from all the negativity around climate change and maybe just maybe a new will to create uh, an energy transition which also involves the uh, exploration of shale around Lancashire and Yorkshire around the rest of Western Europe. Maybe things will change. 03444991000 87222 on the text.